Steve R. in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, as the case may be, depending on where you're joining us from today. My name is Mike Rustasy, and thank you for coming to our webinar today on uh, the TinCan API and how it's being used in the real world. I'm kind of excited to be given this one today. We've done a lot of previous webinars focusing on TinCan 101, what it is, what TinCan is all about, why it's useful. We've talked about the technical aspects of TinCan in, in previous webinars, but that's not what today is going to be about. Today is going to be about how the industry is actually adopting and using TinCan. We're starting to see this stuff happen in the real world and how actual production tools, people actually using these things, and that's a, that's a really exciting point upon, uh, about emergence of the standard. Um, so if you're expecting Tin Can 101 or, or what Tin Can is, uh, we're, we're not going to be getting into that. I'll do a really quick refresher at the very beginning of the presentation, but if that's what you're expecting, I don't want to waste anybody's time. But hopefully you'll stick around and join us and see some of the ways that you know, tool manufacturers have come out with innovative new things and how some organizations are putting this to, to use really reinvigorate some of their training programs and, and take a really new slant on how an enterprise learning architecture will look and you know what we can do to actually truly educate our users rather than having some page turners down their, their throat, quite frankly. Uh, a couple points of logistics. Questions. We, we love hearing questions. Feel free to ask them. Go ahead and post them in the, the chat window um, in the GoToWebinar section over there. We've got Jeff and Andy working in the background over here curating those questions. They might try to answer some of them as they come in, but we'll save some time at the end to, to go through. I've given a lot of these tin can presentations now, and one thing that's consistent about every single one of them is there are, there are more questions than we can get to at the end of every one of them. So I'm trying to learn my lesson and save a bunch of time for those at the end. Uh, the questions we don't get to during the webinar, we always try to answer offline and then, then post on the blog along with the recording of the webinar for to share with your friends and colleagues. If you're into the whole Twitter thing, there's the Tin Can API hashtag up on the, the screen right there for you to tweet along and, and, and tell the world about all the great stuff we're talking about over here. So we're going to start with just kind of a, a quick overview of where we are today with, with Tin Can uh, it's a pretty exciting time. This project came out of research about a year and a half ago. And uh, in a couple weeks, on April 26th, I believe it is, you know, the version 1.0 of the Tin Can Spec will actually be released and it'll be out there. That's the point where it'll be stamped and said to the real world, hey, this is it. We, we've done, we're done playing around with this thing. We're done with the beta period. We're done testing it. This is what it's going to look like. Um, we, we have a lot of conversations potential adopters and people interested in this over here, as you might expect. And I, I think 1.0 is going to be a real milestone. And I talked today a lot of, about a lot of the adoption that we're seeing, uh, but I expect 1.0 to be when a lot of the people who have been sitting on the sidelines showing interest really start to jump in. And there's, a, there's a big group of people out there who are innovative and don't mind taking a little technical risk and like to jump in early and play around and get in on the bleeding edge. And those are the people we're going to be talking about today, the real innovators, the early adopters. But then there's a big mass of people that are a little bit more conservative. They want to wait and, and make sure that what the investment that they make in a new technology is going to be solid. And we're reaching the point where those people are going to be ready to jump in. So remember one point to keep in mind as we go through all this stuff is remember everything we're talking about here is still really, really early. The spec you know, isn't even finalized for a couple more weeks. And, and what we're looking at are the people on the bleeding edge doing the initial things, being be, the people willing to, to take on the technical risk and to trot a path that isn't necessarily easy. Um, and so we're, we're going to talk about them. We're going to show you what they're doing. And I want to give a lot of props to those people who are, are willing to spend with stuff. They're really can get come along. Uh, we, ha we had a conference a couple weeks ago, the, the Learning Solutions Conference, that I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with, and um, perhaps some of you there. And, um, that was really quite a moment for you know, a lot of the other people who have been around Tin Can for oh, beginnings, because um, last year at Learning, my partner Tim Martin, many you might know Tim, and um, Aaron Silvers from, from ADL, you probably know Aaron as well, they they walked around the Learning Solutions Expo floor, and that was when they went to every single vendor over there and introduced themselves and said, hey, this tin can thing is coming. Uh, it's brand new. You're going to start to hear a lot about it in the next year or so. But at that point, it was all about, let's just go introduce this thing to people. 
But this year at Learning Solutions, a few weeks ago, just one year later, 25% uh, 20, of the vendors there had already adopted Tin Can. And, and that is a phenomenal, phenomenal number to see that type of growth and that type of adoption coming so quickly. Uh, so th and that also gives me a lot of stories to tell here. So let's, let's get into it. Uh, first of all, quick refresher for, for those of you who might be a little bit new and who uh, might not have sat through the, the full what is Tin Can presentation and why is it good. Uh, this, this slide here shows kind of a quick overview of some of the things that are, are really good and interesting about Tin Can, the new things that it's going to enable us to do. And we're going to see examples of a lot of these things in the webinar today. So in the, in the top there, you've got mobile. Uh, you know, everybody kind of knows mobile is really hard to do in SCORM, but everybody knows mobile is something we need to be doing. Uh, Tin Can really enables mobile delivery pretty seamlessly. Using simulations in your training also now really educational games, allowing us to perform and support tasks. These are all, all things that we've wanted to do in the industry that Tin Can is now breaking open. And we're going to see you know, examples of all these as we can. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Tin Can also allows us to do things like track real world activities. We're not, we're not limited to learning happening just in a computer anymore. Now we can track learning that happens everywhere. Uh, not to say we ever were actually learning in just in just a computer. The, the acknowledgement though here is that learning really does happen everywhere and the fraction of what you learn in a computer from an e-learning course is really a very, very, very small part of, of what you have learned of the things that you know. Um, TidCan is going to allow us to now start to capture a much broader swath of things that you are learning, the activities you are undergoing to give you a much richer picture of a person and, and their learning. Uh, Tin Can is going to allow us to work with stuff offline. We don't have to have a persistent internet connection anymore. Tin Can is going to allow us to track informal learning. Interesting examples of people putting out tools to allow us to do that already as well. You know, just like we can learn in the real world, we don't. Not everything we learn happens in a classroom setting where students explicitly trying to teach things. You know, this webinar could be a, a learning experience for many of you. Reading a book or a web page. Uh, talking with a peer, a mentor, et cetera, et cetera. Many different types of things are learning that happen in a structured way that Tin Can is going to allow us to start to get a picture into. Some of the really interesting things that I'm excited about that Tin Can to enable analytics and reporting in a much richer sense than to do historically and we'll examples of really innovative new tools coming out and, and structures coming out in those. Um, and lastly, over there, data portability. Can't, with Tin Can, data is inherently portable. It can travel between systems. And that opens up a lot of new possibilities and has people really rethinking how they are you know, putting together a learning system. It opens up you know, ways to put data into specialized reporting tools and to have data move around with the learners. No longer kind of a, a black box or a silo where all of your data can, can go and never be seen. So that's the you know the two minute kind of overview of the the one hour typically tin can one on one presentation and what this this stuff does. So let's dive in and start looking at some of the the tools that are available that are taking advantage of tin can. And uh, as we go through, I, my, my goal here today is for you guys to use these examples as seeds for your imagination. Take a look at what's being done. Use that as inspiration. See what is now possible and apply that to what you want to do in your organization. The big thing that I'm excited about with Tin Can is it really opens the door for it really opens the door for people to be able to you train and educate however they want to. It allows you to break out of the box, break out of the mold, think outside of the box. And that's what I'm hoping to inspire here is to see what some of the things other people have done and say, hey, that could apply to my organization in this way, or maybe we could do something similar in this way. But one of my favorite quotes um, right, that, that was made by Tom Friedman, he said, big breakthroughs happen when what is suddenly possible meets what is desperately necessary. And I think that's a perfect analogy for what we have going on right here. Tin Can is making a lot of things suddenly possible. And many of them are desperately necessary. I know a lot of people are very frustrated with the tools and infrastructure available to them in their training world. I, I think right now, all of a sudden, we have sudden, 
suddenly possible new things that we can do that are meeting a big, big swath of demand. And I, I hope you guys will be able to take something away. Uh, I want you to look at how we're kind of moving beyond the page turn, how we've broadened the ecosystem. And, and, and really think about how learning can happen wherever and whenever and however it's most effective and most necessary. So starting in on um, some of the traditional authoring tools that are starting to support Tin Can. You're, you're seeing a lot of the traditional e-learning vendors jump in and support Tin Can and acknowledge that this is going to be the way the industry is working going forward. Uh, so some of these traditional authoring tools you'll see up here, you, you recognize a lot of these names, Articulate, Lectora, Domino, Rapid Intake, Raptivity, Zebra Zaps from the app folks over at Allen. Uh, these guys are all getting on board and updating their tools to use Tin Can. Their, their motivations are several fold, more robust tracking. Some of them have problems getting SCORM to work across a variety of platforms. Many of them are using it for mobile support. Uh, a lot of them are also motivated by even being able to host their content cross domain, have it be deployed wherever makes the most sense, not just within a learning management system. And some of them are also using it to track a lot more richer detail about the user interactions tool. Articulate Storyline was one of the, the first early adopters that really jumped in because they wanted to deploy their content from Storyline out on iPad. They, they had all the infrastructure to be able to do that. They were ready to go but they didn't have any way to track it in LMSs. They looked at Tin Can and said, yes, this is going to be a perfect solution for us. And so they were, they were one of the first people to, to jump in on this, and they've had support in Storyline and production now for, for a very long time and can be very enthusiastic about it. So in summary there, the, the traditional e-learning vendors are starting to, are jumping in on this. They're, they're doing it, and th their tools are now going to be able to play in this new ecosystem. The same thing is happening with traditional learning management system vendors and content delivery platform. You can see a lot of logos that you recognize up here. Um, and largely their motivations are the same as content vendors. They want to be able to support mobile learning, cross-domain stuff. They want to be able to track things in a little bit more detail. And as I mentioned earlier, really, these early adopters deserve a lot of credit for pioneering, uh, being pioneering and innovative organizations to take on some risk and provide their better products. These guys have, have all jumped in really early. And implementing the learning record store side of Tin Can is not a trivial amount of work. It's, it's a good amount of effort to get in it and add that support. And these guys are, are doing it and then now kind of changing it and redoing it as the, the standard continues to evolve. But some of the things we are, are seeing with the adoption of Tin Can within the, the kind of learning management system world is the first stage of adoption for these guys is for them to adopt at what we call the SCORM parity level. To use Tin Can to do what could be done before in a better way. So you know, Tin Can opens up a lot of different ways you can track things, a lot of different modes for how you can report and represent the activities of a user. What we're seeing so far, for the most part, is you know is that first baby step of we're going to keep our existing models of you know register for a course and take the course and your grade book or your transcript or what have you. And, and, but they're able to do that with Tin Can now to have SCORM to solve a lot of the technical problems um, that we've seen. Uh, one of the surprising trends that we've seen from a, a few of the LMS vendors is that they're focusing on publishing activity streams of what is happening within the LMS rather than consuming them. Uh, and that, that was something rather unexpected as we started with the Tin Can thing. We always just that the LMS provider would, would take the position of trying to be the person to consume all of the tin can data and track everything that happened and manage that and present that. But some are taking the, the tact of we're going to publish everything that happens in our LMS via uh, a tin can activity stream into a centralized learning record store. So like I said, we'll talk more about that later. So I wanted to just kind of go through this quick summary of the kind of the existing traditional e-learning vendors who have been uh, adopting Tin Can and doing things with it. We're going to now transition to the rest of the presentation about talking about kind of non-traditional vendors or new vendors doing some innovative things with Tin Can, introducing new capabilities. And we're going to break it out into a few different categories of, of vendors and categories of tools. And we're going to start first with you know, kind of social learning, informal learning, and real world learning, all, all grouped into category here with a few tools in there. First one I'd like to talk about is a company called Curator. 
boosting social collaboration in virtual classrooms. A curator basically provides an online platform that enables instructors to transform any digital content into a social game for learning, kind of a, a virtual classroom focused on a topic, for education or, or even with organizations and companies. What becomes interesting is learners actually become the ones to contribute the learning object into this room. You, you can think of any web page becoming a learning object that could be put into, into curator and shared with the group and become part of you know, the, the discussion happening on the topic. The class discusses why the resources that were contributed are interesting, branches off on the topic, they've got commenting and collaboration all worked into there. And it's gamified. The more the student contributes to the discussion, the more points they receive. Uh, the board there. But the curator is actually using Tin Can as a core part of their platform. They use Tin Can to track all of these social collaborations, all these contributions of content, um, and they're using that to then have some personalization features and report back uh, some advanced uses all, all seamlessly with Tin Can API. These are all things that Tin Can you know, very, seamless, very well supports. Uh, so you, now th think about this. We've, we've got a tool that previously we, you know, curator could exist without Tin Can, but but now all of a sudden the things that happen in a curator instance can all be tracked as part of the overall learning ecosystem of your your learning environment. That couldn't happen before, and that that makes a difference. Another one. Similar is a company called PulseWeb. They're a social media company out of the Netherlands, and PulseWeb is focused on creating closed internal social networks. So this is something that it's not a learning application. But PulseWeb is simply a social network that gets deployed inside your organization. And you know, similarly, they've gathered some points for social media contributions. They've got a, a leaderboard of participants. They're able to you know, track people's contributions on Yammer or whatever. But Pulse has gone ahead and integrated Tin Can to start tracking all of these um, social learning events. They're, they're realizing that the internal social networks are also related to learning activities. They've adopted Tin Can to start publishing what is happening on these social networks. So again, think about this. You know, Pulse Web could exist without Tin Can as a standalone application, but now all of a sudden we can very easily integrate all of this, these social applications into our corporate learning environments. Another application, these guys, Tapestry from Float Mobile, these guys have been around since the very beginning as well. And this is one of my favorite examples that I like to talk about in a lot of these presentations. I like to think of Tapestry as a, a four square for learning, to check in at the learning event you share what you record your learning. Uh, we, we talk a lot about how Tin Can can start to capture informal learning or learning in the real world, and the first question we always get is, well, how? There's, Tin Can doesn't put some microphone or sensor up in the sky that's going to track what you do. It's not going to be a chip implanted in your brain to track everything that you're learning. There has to be some way to capture the learning events that you think are necessary. And Tapestry is you know, one of the first co companies to come out with an innovative way of doing that. Uh, some other examples for how that could be done. We've got a prototype, which is a bookmarklet, where if you're in your web browser you want to record that you've learned something, you can click on a little I learned this button on your browser toolbar That's you know then records that you've experienced the web page that you're currently on. We've got another prototype application out there that's a book scanner. It's a little Android application, and if you've read a book that you want to record as a learner, you scan the... Uh, the barcode on the back of the book, and the application looks up what that book title is and stores that in your in your learning record store as something that you have decided to to learn about. Uh, the the ways we can capture informal learning are just beginning to emerge. There's a couple more in here, uh, but I, I'm I'm really excited about the innovation that can happen in, in this domain. Uh, I think I think we've only begun to see the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, my overall premise on how we're going to be able to capture informal learning events is that I don't know exactly how it, we're going to it's going to manifest itself, but I do know that our lives are increasingly pervaded by digital systems which know what we're doing and schedule our lives, control our lives, and that presents a lot of opportunities to capture really interesting 
about the things we're doing and the things that we're learning. Well, I'm excited to see some innovation in this area. Uh, a company that's been focusing on trying to capture informal learning, what's known uh, amongst a lot of people as the 70%, 70% of learning is informal, uh, is a company called Brightway. They've got a, a next generation LMS and they've been focusing on using TinCan to capture informal learning events. You know, the, the way I understand it is they've implemented some variations on that that bookmark example that allow you to track the things you're doing, I believe, from, from an iPad or from a browser, and set, you know, record these things into uh, their next generation LMS. It's bringing in informal learning via tin can. A pretty innovative example, uh, a new application called MapDeck that you may have seen at a lot of the industry conferences recently. MapDeck is an application that allows conference attendees to download the most meaningful slides from conference presentations. So when we go speak at a conference, we always upload our slide deck to the um, to the conference organizer's website that they have and that they make available to the attendees to download. Well, what MapDeck does is it plugs into all of those slides and instead of somebody deciding they want to download my entire presentation about Tin Cam, they can say, you know, there was one or two slides that I found really useful and I want to just download those and create an assembly of those, those really useful slides across all of the presentations. MapDeck is an application that allows you to do that, to search across those and, and grab the ones that you want. MapDeck decided to use Tin Can to track people's use of those slides to power analytics on which presentations, topics, and speakers were most influential at a, a given conference. Again, a very non-traditional application from a learning world that we can now all of a sudden start to plug into our learning infrastructure. And, and that's kind of the theme on, on a lot of these. Is these are all applications that, that can exist without Tin Can, but now we can use them in our, our learning environment and we can have them integrated, we can have all the data flowing into central places. Next section of um, applications we're going to talk about focuses on the, the use of games and simulations for learning. And, and this is another one that I'm pretty excited about because it gets way beyond the page turner to things that people enjoy doing, to things that people can actually become really engaged with. I think that the uh, biggest crisis facing the e-learning e industry has just been how boring so much of the content is. People don't look at this stuff as opportunities to learn often. They look at it as stuff they need to get done and just get through and get over with. Uh, and we can do better than that. We have the technology, we have the know-how to do better than that. We have what it takes to you know, actually deliver, actually use the computer to enhance the learning experience rather than to simply deliver it. And I, I think a great way to do that is through immersive educational games and simulations. So some of the people you know, taking advantage of, um, of these opportunities, the first one I've got up here is Knowledge Guru. They've got a proprietary game engine that uses time-space learning to you know, ensure maximum knowledge transfer. Uh, I don't know all that much about instructional design and all those types of things, but I, I do know that it's a pretty basic premise that when you space out learning over time, you're able to actually reinforce that a whole lot better and really increase attention. Well, the Knowledge Guru has a little game engine that takes advantage of those principles. But th their problem was, Previously, they couldn't really play very well in the e-learning ecosystem because you couldn't package up their game engine into a SCO that you could be delivered in a browser and just you know, port it over to any LMS. Well, well, now they're able to continue to use their game engine, but then just use TinCan API as the bridge between its standalone engine and database and a client's LMS. All of a sudden now, any you know any game engine can start to play into our e-learning worlds. And furthermore, you know, Tin Can allows us to break the mold of just user completed a course and scored 95%. That doesn't really capture what happens in a game where there are many, many attempts and failure is an intentional part of the experience. When you fail a level, you get motivated to go on and try the next level. That's not something that's very easy to capture in the traditional model, but Tin Can's going to allow us to really capture a lot of that rich data. Next one I'd like to talk about, one we just came across actually at that Learning Solutions 
networking conference from a Riptide Learning. They have a complex branching scenario type authoring tool. The, the example here is a, an online game you can go play or that they're showing at the Learning Solutions Conference about the, you're, the, uh, you're the big bad wolf in the, the three little pigs game and you, you have to make a series of choices about how best to eat your little piggy. And you know it's, it's a silly example that's a whole lot of fun to go out and play. It's really lighthearted, but it really illustrates you know, the power of what you could do with all this stuff. Um, what they've done is they've used Tin Can and specifically the, the, the context fields within Tin Can to power all of their branching scenarios to track the the nesting, the choices that you've made as you've gone down each of all of these branches. And, and they're using that to report into a real-time dashboard. So what you see over on the right is a real-time leaderboard as you're going through this of all the other people who are playing it, the attempts they've made, how far they've gotten. Uh, this visualization allows you to compare your performance against the peers. So once again, something that could have been easily developed on its own, but it's a, just another tool in the arsenal for how we can you know, start to apply these things in our ecosystems. Next tool we have up here is a tool called Rapport from Paltech. Um, this is a virtual classroom that works on a variety of operating systems, devices, real time for, for many users in a very, very immersive virtual world. Um, this tool is designed for kind of just in time instruction as well as collaborative and structured instructor letters or even self paced training. And th these types of tools are what I would often see at a, a conference I went to a lot called IETSEC. And IETSEC is the conference I always want to take my dad to because it's a military training conference. They've got all these really high-end flight simulators and you know, the virtual the simulated tanks and you can go blow up stuff and you get into really fun, immersive environments. And it's really high-tech and it looks really real. And one of the things I've, I've been excited about as I've gone to that conference over the year is how the really immersive, really exciting stuff is starting to become more and more accessible to people other than the United States Department of Defense with billion dollar budgets. Uh, th this technology is rapidly moving into you know, the hands of the mere mortals that, like you and me, that we might actually be able to afford this stuff. We can use this stuff. The, these types of immersive environments are available to us to start to incorporate into our training programs. And, and, but just like the game engine, you know, simulations and virtual worlds don't really fit well into the model of storm or completion. A lot of things happen in there, and they don't fit well into the, you know, the simple technology of drop this into the web browser and copy it into your LMS. Uh, so what, uh, what Paltech has done with Rapport is taken their really, really advanced virtual world and allowed you know, the tracking of student action interactions within there to go uh, through Tin Can for a variety of different scenarios. So we, we have another tool we can start to plug into our, um, our learning ecosystem. The next group of, um, of tools is all related to education. And th this is another area where I, I get really excited. I guess, I guess I'm saying I'm getting really excited a lot, but I guess that's just because I am really excited. I'm excited about all this stuff. You can call me a tin can geek, but that's all right. I'm excited about education because I've got small kids. I've got a first grader and a kindergartner. I think there's a chance that some of the stuff we're doing will, will actually be able to make it out into the world in time to affect how they're able to learn and improve how they're able to learn. And, and I'll show you some examples of that in here, of things that can really change things for our kids. So media techniques. Uh, they, they produce interactive digital textbooks. You know, I look at the, some of the kids in my other kids in my kids' elementary school, the, other ki the older kids, and they're walking home from school with, with backpacks that weigh more than they do. You know, they've got pounds and pounds and pounds of textbooks, and then these poor kids are going to break their backs just so they can go home and do their homework. Well, wouldn't it make more sense to put all that stuff on one iPad and have them carry that around? Do we really need you know 500-page textbooks for these kids to be lugging around? And Think about what happens when you digitize a textbook, when you create all that information and put it in a format that's not just electronic, but 
starts to take advantage of all that device can do, the hyperlinking, putting assessment in with the actual um, learning material or putting interactive exercises. You can imagine a biology textbook, for instance, that allows you to you know, actually visualize the human body and take, put layers on and take layers off and see how all these pieces relate to one another. Um, these, these things are possible and they, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to use them. The technology is all there. Um, and now we're able to take it a step further. You know, what Media Technics has done is put tin can support into their books on publish tool. They can deliver information about what is happening in the textbook, how the student is using the textbook to any tin can compatible learning record store. So you can see here they've got some simple assessments associated with this chapter. The teacher now can go look and say, see what the students have done the night before when they were doing the reading. Did they really master all this stuff? And maybe they can use that to adjust their lesson the next day. If they really were into it, they really mastered it really quickly, they can move on to more advanced stuff or talk about it in more depth. If they see that their students maybe just skimmed the material and only have a very cursory understanding, well, then maybe the lecture needs to be a little bit more remedial and dive into the stuff that they were supposed to have read on their own. And I imagine as an educator, as a teacher, you can think of you know, 10,000 more interesting things than, than I was able to just come up with there with what you could do with the information of knowing how, a, uh, how students are doing. Uh, this next, next one, metrics, guess what, I'm excited about this one. But this one I might be the most excited about. Uh, and I think I'm the most excited about this one because for the last year, there's there's been a slide in all my presentations where I talked about metrics, but only in the hypothetical. And then all of a sudden, a few weeks ago, I found that it actually exists and somebody's doing it. So what metrics is, is it started out as an application for an iPad that allows a teacher to do assessments of their, her students, his or her students, and enter them directly into the iPad and have all of that information be reported back into the student's records and to the principal and to the parents and, and all of this kind of stuff. And, um, at, at the surface, what do you do? But when we start to think about all of the assessments that teachers are required to do right now, I, I look at my, you know, my elementary school age kids report card and there's oh, probably a hundred different things that the teacher needs to assess each child on every quarter as they go through these report cards. And you start to imagine the burden of you know, the teacher sitting down with a student to figure out, okay, can my kindergartner, can, can she count to 10? Does she know all of her letters? Can she do basic addition? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They have to assess each of these skills. And so, and then they have to record them in a different bunch of different ways and that data goes to different people and it's responsible for being uh, tied into common core standards and has to go to the state and blah, 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 blah. And so metrics solved a lot of those problems by just giving one point of entry and then flowing the data to a lot of places. But then they took it a step further, and Tin Can was what allowed them to, to take it a step further, and this is what has me excited. Uh, so going back to you know, educational games for a minute, uh, if you've heard me do a, a Tin Can 101 presentation before, you've heard me tell the, the story of uh, my first grader now, Amelia, who will sit down with, she did this mostly in kindergarten, but she would sit down with a game called Princess Math on the iPad. And Princess Math is just the, the silliest little game that you can imagine. And most software developers in the world could program this thing in like a day. All it is is you do addition program problems, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, basic arithmetic. And if you get your answers right and you do so quickly, then you get a new dress to put on your princess. And my goodness, would Amelia play this thing for an hour at a time, just sit there doing math problems for no other motivation than to put a new dress on her little imaginary princess in there. Well, that's great. I, I love the fact that she got really engaged with that. And if you go to the App Store, there's you know, thousands of other games out there that, that do the same things with different skills and with different characters. And you, can, you can really easily imagine Amelia playing Princess Math, uh, but 
Joe playing monster truck math or Lucy playing fairy math or you know, Tommy playing superhero math, et cetera, et cetera. You can see how these things are all diff engaging to people at, or different kids at diff in different ways. Uh, but what metrics did is they said, these kids are playing these games anyway. Let's wire some of them up to report via tin can into our analytics tool. And so now all of a sudden, Amelia goes and plays princess math, either in her classroom or at home. And that tells metrics right away, hey, guess what? Amelia just answered 20 questions in a row correctly on her arithmetic from numbers 1 through 10. She's mastered that skill. Now all of a sudden, Miss McMurray doesn't have to go assess her for that. Amelia is learning. Amelia is enjoying herself. And we're learning what she knows, all seamlessly, all enabled by, by tin can. And I can just start to imagine a world, and this, this makes me happy, I can imagine a world where uh, Miss McMurray, Amelia's teacher, has 20 iPads in her classroom. She hands them out, and the kids just get fired up. They say, yay, it's iPad time. And they go play their own versions of the different math games that are out there, and they have a blast. And for an hour, they just sit there and do nothing but math problems because they're all having fun doing their princess math or their monster truck math or their superhero math. And Miss McMurray's sitting back in real time in metrics watching all that data accumulate. They're, she's watching to see, hey, Amelia really knows her addition problems from 1 to 10. I'm going to go push her to try some subtraction or some multiplication. But I can see over here there's a red line next to Johnny. He's struggling with his addition. Maybe I'm going to go give him a little extra help and see if I can point him in the right direction. I think that makes the kids much more engaged. I think that makes Miss McMurray a much more effective teacher. And that can be applied at, to any subject at any grade level. And we can have all this data starting to flow together in real time uh, because of the Tin Can API. And so uh, I'm really excited about this vision, and I hope that it starts to take hold. There's some other application vendors out there trying to do similar things, and, uh, and I really hope to see this ecosystem emerge. So the, the next set of tools that we're going to talk about all relates to kind of analytics and monitoring actual job performance. <coughs> Excuse me again. So the, the first one here is a tool called Altair, which is capturing actual system usage to assess training and fill gaps. Now, now Altair isn't a learning system vendor at all. They have nothing to do with the training and e-learning system, training and e-learning industry. Altair is a provider of engineering simulation software. They sell software that engineers use to you know, figure out if their designs are going to withstand the stresses of whatever might uh, happen to them. But they need to train their users. People need to learn how to use the software. It's not you know, point and click simple stuff. Uh, so what they're doing is they're using Tin Can to make statements about how the users are actually using the software right from within the software itself. And then they're using the data for how they're actually using the software to make the assessment of whether the user is competent. So no longer are we providing external training and then putting using the test to decide whether they're competent because the test is a marginal assessment of whether somebody is actually competent and proficient in the skill you're trying to train them on. They're using the actual software usage to do that to make that assessment of competency and proficiency. That's a big step forward. That's a big change all of a sudden. We can actually do real assessment to say, hey, did the training work? Was the training effective? Did we actually teach them how to do what we were hoping to teach them to do? And they're using Tin Can to make all of this possible. You know, their future plans, the next step in generation is to use, um, use that same data to suggest additional training in real time based on their performance. Give them some, some performance support to say, hey, I notice you're struggling with this particular simulation type. Here, here's some information that you need just in time. Next uh, application over here, Skillitics, a company out of New Zealand. They've got a, a scenario-based interactive um, engine that is using Tin Can to track all of the different ways people are going through this. But what they're able to do with Tin Can is put forth some really impressive analytics. And those analytics are tied into ROI measures for the organization. Um, I had the chance to sit down with their CEO a couple weeks ago uh, down in 
it was Orlando where we were. Uh, they have they have some really really powerful analytics that they are driving all based on the tin can from their scenario driven training that they have. Uh, interesting thing about Skeletics is they recognize the need for you know, a much more robust way to track the things that were happening in training environments uh, a long time ago. And they had actually started down the road of developing their own standard until they came across Tin Can and said, well, wait, the whole, this is exactly what we need. The industry is already doing this. We're not going to go reinvent the wheel. And so they, they've been kind of doing a lot of this stuff for a while now and are, have been able to, to realign their efforts with the common standard and are really getting behind it. And, doing some great things and have a, a lot of interesting things to, to show that they've done with it from an analytics perspective. Moving on along, the next couple of things we're going to talk about are examples of people adopting tin can in the enterprise. We're, we're not going to talk about, th those are all the tools that we're going to talk about for now. We're going to move on to you know, how, how actual companies and organizations are, are using this day to day. And you know, th these are the adoptions that I, I start to get really excited about the tool because they're the next level. You know, if you kind of look at a chicken and egg type scenario, you've got to have the tools before the enterprises can start to adopt it. And we, we've seen a lot of the tools starting to emerge now. The next thing is for the enterprises to start taking advantage of that. I'll give you a couple of real world examples of people actually doing that and, and some of the interesting things that they're doing with it. So one of the ones that we're working with, uh, actually here in Nashville with us, Vanderbilt University Medical Center they're moving to what we call an LRS-centric architecture. And so uh, for those of you who may not have kind of been through the, the spiel before, what is a learning record store, an LRS? I've used that term a few times now. Uh, a, a learning record store started out in its initial incarnation as being the part of the LMS that tracks all of this tin can data, tracks these tin can activity streams, reports, or stores all that information, and then, you know, implements the tin can API to allow that data to come in and out. Well, as we started to present on tin can and use the word learning record store, a funny thing happened. Everybody started asking, well, where can I get a learning record store? How can I get my hands on one of these things? And it turns out that the model of creating an independent learning record store as a centralized place to store data about learning from many different contexts is gaining a lot of traction. And Vanderbilt's been one of the pioneers of actually moving their whole architecture to be centered around a learning record store. And you can see here on, on the diagram, they've got learn, data coming into the learning record store from many different places. Vanderbilt is an organization like many of yours, I'm sure, that has many LMSs out there and that's been a big problem for them. And so one of the things they're thinking about doing now is having all of the LMSs report data into a centralized learning record store. So they have one place to look at all of this data across different parts of the organization. Let all of the departments keep the LMS that meets their specific use case, but then have that data all flow into you know, a centralized place. Remember when we talked very early on on the third or fourth slide about LMS providers publishing their activity data as opposed to consuming it. Some of that is in support of this model where you know, the LMS serves a very important role of tracking a lot of formal training, ensuring compliance needs are met, but then they're publishing the data out to the learning record store that's bringing that in with informal learning or classroom events or in Vanderbilt's case, medical simulations. And the portability of that data is now all made possible because of tin can. Remember in tin can, data can move between systems very easily. It can move from an LMS into an LRS. It can move from one LRS to another LRS. Very interestingly here in, in the Vanderbilt case, it can move from the learning record store into their, an analytics engine in their business intelligence tool. Well, one of the things that's pretty fun about this project is they want to be tying learning outcomes to their organizational, what they call pillar goals. So, uh, if I remember right, one of their pillar goals is uh, centered around hand washing, making sure everybody washes their hands to increase sanitation, reduce infection, all these kind of things. That's a that's an organizational top level goal, and they're able to somehow measure when people are washing their hands. Well, they also want to then tie the training data about, hey, we delivered all this training to say, hey, go wash your hands. They want to tie that in with the actual performance of washing their hands and then actually look at, you know, did that pillar goal reduce infections and everything? And they're starting to be able to correlate all of that data now. Um, the other little circle on here is something called the TDS. It's what we call a training delivery system. They're 
what Vanderbilt is doing is also, in addition to centralizing all the learning data, they're also centralizing you know, basically you know, a player for all of their SCORM content and other kind of formalized training. So now they can maintain all of their training in one place and have that used by all the different LMS and other systems that are out there, which is another interesting thing we're seeing people starting to, to look at. So uh, this is uh, another company that's being worked on by a company called Epic over in the UK for a UK-based retailer who uh, needs to remain anonymous to their actual name. Uh, but what they've done is they wanted to do a lot of training on a mobile app and have that be fully available offline. Uh, and interestingly, they want their users to never have to go to the LMS to take their training. They want all of their training to be just available on the mobile app. And so at what Epic has been able to do for this retailer is create this application have it all tracked into their um, into their central LMS through an owner and record store, but they never have to go into the LMS to take the training. They just pop up their app, take their training. A couple other really interesting tidbits from how they're using Tin Can here is they're actually using the Tin Can API itself to store the organizational structure of the corporate hierarchy for reporting. The tool on the LRS don't need to be aware of the learner's information or the org chart ahead of time. They're using some of the constructs of the tin can data model to start to organically form all of that as the data comes in. One of the big problems that we see with a lot of enterprise learning organizations is that a new hire comes on and you know, their information then needs to go into the HR system, which then has a data feed that goes over into the LMS to give the, them a user ID and to have that user reported to the LMS, but for some reason, sometimes that process can take a week, and so you've got a new hire who needs to do all their new hire training, but they can't get into the LMS for a week after they've started because the LMS doesn't know about them yet. That's an interesting bit of Tin Can, is with Tin Can, since we don't have to originate in the LMS, then the LRSs can start to track information about a learner before they know about them. Uh, with the project with Epic, they're doing something similar for the core structures. They're using the Tin Can data model to start to define the core structure, the hierarchical relationships between all the different bits of content. And then they're able to produce reporting and analytics based on all the Tin Can data that compares the training information across stores and regions, and et cetera, for this department store. So uh, another fun one also happens to be a university health system, the University of Michigan. Who, who summarizes what they're trying to do as use cases we have never been able to come close to trying before. And they've got you know, a big plan that they're in the first couple phases of for implementing new things based on Tin Can right now. I'll go, I'll go through some of those. So they're starting off by simply using Tin Can, at, again, that score and parity level. They're trying to alleviate a lot of the issues they've had tracking with score. And they've got a really, really old docent LMS that they've um, been trying to keep going, but that had a lot of uh, had a lot of issues with tracking SCORM. And so they're using Tin Cans as a much more robust way to start tracking all that data. They're also then trying to incorporate content from outside their firewall into their learning environment and traditional. The other thing they're doing is they're starting to track completion of content on mobile devices. That's all kind of the phase one pretty straightforward type of um, uses. So some of the other things they are looking at doing is creating what they call a drop dead easy and free authoring of trackable content on, based on WordPress and Gravity Form quizzes. That they're taking some open source basic content management tools and open form tool creation tools and using Tin Can to turn those into things that are able to create very basic content to make any subject matter expert able to easily create content that fits into their learning experience. Next thing they're doing is what they call bite-sized learning, where they're going to email a lot of their mastery quizzes, just one question per week, directly into a user's inbox. So instead of trying to assess somebody all at once, they're going to, again, use those principles of you know, time-based learning to send little bits right into the inbox once a week and allow the user, right from their inbox, to answer a question and have that all tie back into the learning record store. Again, not something that's hard to do, but now we can all of a sudden start to tie this really simple and effective training mechanism into our learning records. 
The, the next one is a track mentoring project to where you can earn badges for knowledge sharing and they're going to be and to, you know, as part of their mentoring tool to track how things are doing. They also want to create a personal learning record store for access to your transcript that you can move down across the organization. And one of my favorite ones that I, I've seen here that just it seems so great and it kind of goes back to you know, the excitement level. This is so easy and obvious and should be done that I have for the kind of the classroom and the iPad stuff is they've got new hire scavenger hunts where they've gone ahead and put QR codes on things around the hospital that the new hires need to learn about. And so part of the new hire training is to go around, find the thing you need to learn about, and scan the QR code on there. And that QR code is going to then give you a little of assessment to say, hey, did you learn about this or what have you? Um, and that will all be you know, tied back into the, the new hire train orientation to make sure that they've done things correctly. But later on, that QR code is still there. And so if I want to go back and learn about something after I've done my new hire stuff on the job, I can just scan that QR code, get the bit of instruction that I need right away. They're also using TinCam to track um, the preceptor checklists for when preceptors are assessing their performance. And they really want to get into the tracking of informal as well. <clears throat> so lots of big plans from the University of Michigan. They're in the middle of implementing a lot of this stuff, as are as are most of the organizations here, all very early implementing stuff. So we've got a few more minutes. I'm going to run through what I call other fun stuff. These are my kids and a few others having fun in the creek right now. And we've got two little fun things, and I'll try to take a, a couple questions. If have any in there? So this is an application called uh, Watershed that we um, have put out for a while now. And Watershed is a, a very basic beta application at this stage, but, but what it is is something we call the, the personal data locker. And the idea here is now that statements are able to travel around, it's very easy to imagine that when I go from employer to employer, my training records could go with me. The things that I've learned could go with me. We'll take that to the next logical conclusion, and really, shouldn't those statements be mine? Aren't they like my resume? Shouldn't those go into a place that I control, and then I can choose with whom I, I want to share them? Um, and th there's a lot of you know, kind of organizational, political, business constraints around these things. But from the technological perspective, it's there. And from many people's perspective, this seems to be the, the right model, where I own my learning records. And as an employer, what I really want to know about somebody is, isn't so much their resume, but rather their ability to learn. And so we're really excited about the possibility of the personal data locker as the right model for storing learning data going forward. We've got a very, very early proof of concept application that you can, you can use right now at watershed.ws that is making that possible. Another recent um, application that we created as a little proof of concept fund that hopefully we'll be able to release sometime soon here is tied into Google Hangouts, where we, you know, we use Google Hangouts a lot for holding meetings within our company, especially with remote employees or people outside the organization. What we're doing in here is simply using TinCan to allow to us to all track who's been able, who's been in the Hangout, which could be an interactive, you know, an educational session. Similarly, if we could commence go to a meeting or go to webinar to put a little button, we could put a little button in this go to webinar thing that says, "Hey, record that all hundred of you who are here have attended this webinar and learned something about TinCan." A lot of interesting possibilities coming up there. So final slide here, just kind of to go through conclusion. Uh, these are adopters that we talked about. They're the tip of the iceberg. There's a broader list of adopters available on TinCan, API.com. You can see many of them here up on this slide here. But, but that doesn't even begin to cover a lot of the people who are you know, working on the problem now, haven't released the software yet. These are the people people who jumped in, have been innovative, have really been pioneers over the last year. There are hundreds and hundreds more who are all already working on more, um, more tools, more enterprise adoptions. It's really just the, the tip of the iceberg. I'm excited to see what is coming on. So in summary, you can see we're really starting to move past the page turner, getting into learning modalities that are right for the situation and not encumbered by traditional models. Uh, yeah, I, I go back to my quote again, that big breakthroughs happen when what is suddenly possible meets what is desperately necessary. And I'm excited to see the, the big breakthroughs that are happening right now.
So we, we've got about five minutes left. I didn't leave quite as much time as I was hoping to to, to answer questions. But um, if you if you have some, go ahead and put them in the chat window. And I see Jeff and Andy sending some over to me, so I'll click on a few of them here and start to uh, to go go through them. First one. I got the idea that a vendor can track the use of nearly any kind of material with tin can, other than this form. But if we think of learning, especially in the context of informal learning, as something that belongs to the user, how does the user take his learning records with him from all the different vendors, LRSs? Does the user need an LRS of his own if he wants to keep track of all his learning? Or is this rather outside the scope of the perspective of tin can? You could argue the user might not even know he's learning at the point where he's reviewing some material. So yeah, a great point. I think we touched on that a little bit with the model of the personal data locker. We, we firmly believe that the model of the personal data locker that allows you to take your training records with you is the right way to go, and that is now suddenly possible in this industry. There are certainly some you know, business concerns to figure out. I don't think every business is going to want to share all of their training data on their employees. I would argue, though, that the value to a business of being able to receive data on prior training about their employees from before their involvement with them exceeds the loss and effort of having to share their data. So as a whole, I think it's a win for organizations to be able to do that. To address the point about you know learners might not even know they're learning, and that, that is absolutely correct. You know, a lot of this stuff requires a manual intervention to track something that I consider a significant learning event. And that is never going to capture 100% of what I learn. You know, there's some context in which we implicitly know a person is learning where we can begin to track these things. Uh, but there's, there's going to be others that are, are not. And we're never, ever going to get to 100%. Next question I have in here. We are more interested in functionality and how to apply Tin Can to our own educational platform and website. Can you recommend which webinar we should attend in the future? So I would go back and uh, review the, the Tin Can 101 and Tin Can technical webinars that we've done in the past. Uh, those are both recorded up on our website, tincanapi.com slash webinars. And those will give you kind of a lot of the how-to and you know, the functionality of what it does. If, for, if you've got further questions, just go ahead and email us, and we'll, we'll dive into it a little bit more in terms of which webinars we should attend in the future. We don't have any formally planned yet. We'll figure out what we're going to do next probably after we're done with this one and, and let everybody know who's on our mailing list if you're interested in staying abreast of what's coming up. Sign up for the newsletter at the top of tincanapi.com. Um, but yeah, if, if you have more questions or have, have requests for a webinar you'd like us to do, feel free to, to give us a shout we'll to hear from you. What organization maintains the API, and is that organization responsible for future enhancements to the API? Good question. So the history of TinCan is it was uh, created by our company, Rusty Software, as part of a research grant from ADL, the Advanced Distributed Learning Unit, which is a research lab within the Department of Defense. We did that, and we created it, and then we turned it over to them. And now that is the TinCan API is owned by ADL, by the United States government. They formally call it the Experience API for a variety of technical reasons that you can read about in our blog. Um, so they formally own it. They are evolving it as part of an open working group that you can uh, get involved with should you so desire. And on their website, you can find the, the links to start getting involved with the open working group, although that's you know, largely winding down over the next few weeks as we cross the T's and dot the I's. Uh, how this will evolve into the future, I think ADL will continue to maintain it for the near future, but their long-term goal is to hand it over to an open standards body. I know that they are working on that and, and working to select the right one. I, I don't know how quickly that will happen, but they will be responsible for things long-term. So uh, we've only got about one minute left. I'm going to wrap up the questions. We'll, we'll answer the rest of them offline. Uh, or if you have more, feel free to either post them into the chat right now or go ahead and, and send them offline. I wanted to conclude by just saying thank you very much for attending. Be sure to stay in touch. Drop us a line anytime. We like hearing from you. We love talking about Tin Can. Uh, go ahead and if you want to stay in touch, subscribe to the blog or the newsletter for when we're going to be putting on more webinars and to stay abreast with things that are happening with Tin Can. Again, send us questions anytime. 
we're working with a lot of organizations using a new methodology we've developed to make tin can a reality and you know all these things you know look great and everything but there's a lot of hard work that goes on under the scenes to to make them all a reality and tin can is is a very very simple specification but it's deceptively complex and it's a real implementation and to figure out you know all the best practices around all that stuff all that stuff is is just emerging and there's a lot of really interesting work going on. So thank you all for taking the time to join us today, and I, I hope to hear from you guys soon. Bye now.